So uh, before starting off, uh, I had a conversation with some of uh, some of you guys who are sitting over here, and uh, I found that not all of you are uh, from the uh, programmers community or the JavaScript community. So uh, with a show of hands, can uh, uh, everyone say uh, as to who all are the programmers over here? Okay. Uh, how many of you are into core JavaScript? Okay. Okay. Uh, code JavaScript, I, I mean, uh, you are writing JavaScript code in uh, like in a week, at least. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter a lot. Uh, though, uh, regarding uh, uh, other people who are from the project management or uh, other, uh, I, I would say that it's it's not uh, very geeky. It's not, it doesn't dive uh, into the code, uh, but it's more about uh, discussion regarding as to what are the things that you can do with service workers and uh, how you can use them uh, if you intend to. So that is what uh, this talk will be focusing upon. Uh, so thanks a lot for the uh, Singapore JS to allow me to actually give this talk. I uh, didn't know that uh, it was one of the agendas to discuss about uh, service workers. Uh, though I'll, I'll not be describing as to how, uh, uh, how you can write uh, your own code for uh, having a service worker of your own. Uh, you can have that basically via just simple Google search that allows you to see some tutorials. Uh, this discussion is more focused towards what you can achieve uh, by doing uh, multiple other things inside service workers. So uh, let's start. So a small survey is uh, what I'm going to put in and uh, you can simply respond uh, with a show of hands. So uh, my first question will be, how many of you are aware of more than one feature of uh, service workers? Just with a show of hands. Uh, you can think of uh, offline being it um, and uh, any other uh, feature apart from offline will be considered. So uh, okay, not a lot of people I would say. But uh, let's let's see. After this uh, uh, after this presentation, I intend to have a lot more people who will be interested towards uh, uh, I mean writing some code using service workers. Uh, and what about the people who had, who had just raised your hand? Uh, how many of you are actually using service workers in your project? Okay, just one or two. Uh, not not much adoption actually. Uh, okay, no worries. Uh, what about uh, uh, your applications of using service workers? So if I may ask you, uh, what is uh, how are you using service worker? Is it for offline experience? Uh, I use it to servers and uh, storing them inside IndexDB is what the service workers are doing. Uh, instead of uh, having that logic and the application is what I'm able to understand, right? Okay. Some, some cool. Uh, maybe some, some uh, specific reason for uh, doing it this way. Uh, maybe we can discuss it later. So, so let's start uh, with our conversation. Uh, so what is a service worker? You can think of it as a scriptable interceptor slash network proxy. Or you can even think of uh, as a small script uh, that is running uh, every time in, in, in a person's uh, web browser who has used your website. So uh, when a person comes to your website and uh, you have your service worker script, so uh, your service worker will get registered onto the browser and uh, your, uh, your uh, service worker script will be available all the time. So let's say that uh, in case uh, a person has left your uh, website tab uh, on, his, uh, on, his, uh, uh, on his browser, and uh, you want to send some information via web push uh, or like a, a push notification, then you can do that via service workers. So it is one of the use cases that I just said, uh, though the most popular as of now is this, uh, net, is, is it being used as a network proxy. So uh, prefetching resources is what he just mentioned about, uh, that uh, via service workers you can basically uh, prefetch the resources. But it's not just about the data that you intend to display or use uh, or create HTML uh, using that data, but it's also about the static resources. 
so that you can fetch them, uh, I mean, you can prefetch them basically. Second comes in is uh, syncing data. Uh, that is when offline and uh, after being offline. So once a person is offline, uh, you don't have uh, any control in, uh, uh, in storing that data, right? Either you can do it inside a local cache of uh, local storage, or the other way to go, uh, to go with it is to basically uh, let the service worker maintain it. How it will uh, differ from the current implementation of storing it inside your index DB is that uh, you uh, is that the current workflow of your application won't be affected by uh, integration of service workers. So by that I mean uh, whatever requests are made uh, when you're offline, your service worker can understand that uh, this is an offline experience that a person is handling. And in those cases, it can uh, basically uh, uh, store all the data in any way it wants to. And once it's online, it can uh, sync up with the service without actually your application to take care of it. So that's how you can uh, uh, have a syncing data feature in the service worker. Next comes in offline capabilities. That's the most popular feature of uh, service worker where people uh, uh, cache uh, static resources, cache the data that they're actually displaying, rendering uh, into the HTML pages. And uh, that's how you can provide an offline experience. So, uh, uh, so if, if you intend to have a website, maybe for a conference or uh, some other page, uh, page which doesn't get updated, or even if uh, you, have a, you have some sort of single page application, you might want to explore this feature so that uh, you're able to provide an experience when uh, the person is not online. For example, uh, if you're having a 3G network and a uh, person is going into a software, maybe the connectivity might uh, deteriorate, right? And in those cases, you might want to uh, not deteriorate the customer's experience. I mean, he can take some actions at least, or just read the data, right? So which doesn't uh, which doesn't require a network connectivity. So in those cases, you might want to ex actually explore this offline experience. Comes next is the fallback response. For example, a 404 request for an image. So if you are actually uh, asking or looking for, or you have added an image onto your web page, and uh, you you see that uh, it's giving a 404 error. In those cases, what you can do is you can basically get another image in that place. So it will be, uh, such, such things can be done very easily uh, via application logic also. Though uh, using service workers, you can have an experience where uh, you don't actually uh, uh, change your application's code. Instead, you add another feature via service worker that it takes care of uh, these situations. The next uh, is mock responses. You can also, uh, how many of you have uh, used some other APIs or uh, uh, built on top of some other APIs or consumed some other platforms API? Okay, a couple of hands. So in those cases, uh, what we usually see is that uh, in case that service is not available, what we intend to do is basically uh, maybe use Charles or some other uh, software that allows us to mock the responses. So in case, uh, so a library hasn't built so far, but you can even explore creating a library via service workers that allows you to actually see as to uh, for which request you want what sort of data. Using that, you can basically mock a response. And in the application code, it will be purely uh, that your service worker is handling those re uh, requests and responses, and your application is working as it should in, even in the production. So that is how you can leverage uh, service workers uh, uh, to mock the responses. Comes next. Communication between renderer and uh, service worker uh, using post message API. So that is how a web page can interact with uh, with a service worker. So basically, service worker allows you to offload uh, what you will uh, process a a on a web page. If you think that it's uh, CPU consuming, you might want to actually uh, offload it to a service worker so that it can do it for you and then give it back. Uh, there are several other things that uh, are integrating with the service worker API. For example, animation. So that will, uh, so when, when that happens, what you can do is basically, uh, in case you, you are doing a lot of processing in some way and uh, wants to offload that particular experience, you can hand it over to service worker, which will be taking care of it, and uh, you won't be blocking your uh, single thread on, on the JavaScript site in your web application. Comes next, uh, timeout request. So uh, I guess uh, most of you should be aware of uh, a single point of failures. Uh, uh, should I explain what is single point of failures? So single point of failures is uh, uh, is a situation when you have put in uh, some sort of uh, static resource onto your web page and it's not available. So what will happen is that the browser will make a call to the uh, to fetch that particular resource, but if it's not available, then it will wait for it 
and your uh, page uh, page rendering will, will be stopped till that resource is available or gets to it. Um, so different browsers have different timeouts for it. For example, Chrome has around uh, 30 to 40 seconds for it. But because of a resource which is taking 30 to 40 seconds to get to your client, your client will, won't be able to see any uh, any part of your web page because the rendering of your web page has been stopped for fetching that particular resource. You don't want to have such situations, but they usually come in very frequently when you're using uh, uh, maybe uh, some other third-party uh, scripts for uh, st uh, for your site analysis or, uh, or or some other service. So this is uh, the way that you can now go over it. So the reason for uh, using uh, um, for using service workers uh, for a request timeout and not using asynchronous way is that a lot, a lot of services, for example, A/B testing services uh, like Optimizely, they allow you to only uh, have the uh, have the synchronous code in place, have the synchronous JavaScript in place, which is like render blocking, right? What happens in those cases when a CDN is down of Optimizely? What will you do in those cases? So in those cases. Uh, basically, you don't have any other option, uh, but uh, but your page rendering will be stopped. So uh, what they say is that uh, they have an SLA uh, which is 99.99%. Uh, but in uh, in those very small percent, uh, when it is down, in those cases your page will be affected. Using service workers, you can basically have a timeout uh, for those cases. Then comes in offline analytics caching. Um, over here, uh, it's a use case where uh, if you're having Google Analytics, for example, as an example, if you take uh, Google Analytics, whatever data or requests have been made to Google Analytics server or any other analytics server, uh, and uh, while a user is offline, they can be cached uh, by, a, by the service worker, and they can be synced later after a person is online. Okay, so that is how uh, we can use. I guess uh, a demo won't work uh, because it's simple to understand, right? Then coming on, uh, requesting JSON and uh, render HTML via cache templates. So uh, a lot of time gets consumed, more, uh, a lot more in single page applications when you're rendering uh, your web page uh, by using uh, by using library that allows you to render, uh, use, your, use your JSON data and create HTML on the fly. So in those cases, what happens is that uh, the HTML that's created as a template, uh, it, it, it takes time uh, for, to get built in case your data is huge. So in those cases, what you can do is basically cache those HTML templates and use it uh, uh, once again whenever uh, a person does a page refresh, or even before, uh, you, uh, or even before uh, when you uh, when the page is getting loaded. So it can be done in parallel. So that can uh, basically reduce the running, uh, reduce the start render time of your web page. The next comes in. Uh, don't invalidate the complete resource. What I just mentioned previously. Uh, was that you can cache uh, your static resources, okay? For example, you can cache the entire CSS, but when your CSS gets updated, what in those cases? You might want to actually get only the CSS that's newly added, right? So uh, based on the HTTP archive data, uh, almost 97% of the CSS files that are loaded, they are like 97% of them are the same as the previous one. And just 3% is the one that has changed. So why do you actually load the uh, I mean the entire hundred percent, right? It's no point. So, why, so using uh, some other plugin or uh, writing some code in uh, in your service worker, you can basically get the diff uh, of uh, of a particular static resource and use the same instead of downloading the entire file. Next comes in uh, images and service workers. Uh, so images have a lot more to do with the service workers because they are. Uh, I mean, they, they are huge, right? I mean, most of the time that is taken uh, on the networking uh, performance of your web page is taken by the images because they are quite heavy. So in those cases, you might actually want to offload this process some way. The following are the methods that you can do. Uh, comes in next is dynamic image format. So uh, how many of you are aware of WebP image format? Okay, a couple of hands. Uh, WebP allows, uh, is a better compression algorithm uh, that's available for compressing your images. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, available for, uh, for all of the browsers and is limited to, uh, to the browser support. In those cases, what you might want to do is that depending upon uh, what is the browser or whether it allows the use of WebP, you might want to have that particular image in place. So using service workers, you can basically intercept the uh, request for a particular image, see as to what the header is sent, 
for that particular uh, image uh, because that will be uh, sent by the browser which will say that yeah i allow a webp uh, a webp image i support a webp image and when you say that you can basically modify the uh, the requested url uh, that may be for your cdn a lot of the cdns allow it that uh, they can basically change uh, change uh, they, they can basically respond with a webp format image uh, in case a browser allows it Though a lot, uh, though a lot of CDNs don't. In those cases, you can basically use service workers and um, do it by your own script instead of relying on the CDNs. Next comes in is uh, image sprite sheet. So image sprite sheet, uh, most of us use it uh, in CSS, right? Uh, with a hack or with a functionality where we actually uh, sim uh, where we actually signify it uh, using the background image, uh, the CSS rule, and that's how you can uh, uh, you can use uh, image sprite sheet. Though, if you in actually intend to use those images in different parts of the page without using the CSS, so how, how will you do it? That logic can be basically extracted into, uh, into the service worker so that whatever the request comes in, you can actually in the image sprite sheet, see what image it is and depending upon that, create a resource for it and send it back to the request that was made by, the, by your application. So that's how you can even now, uh, uh, differentiate the logic of uh, using uh, image sprite sheet from your application to the service workers. So this is a simple example. Uh, extracted SVGs can be used in multiple ways. It's just an example where I've demonstrated that uh, the SVG master is the single file which contains all of the SVGs that are coming from the server. They go to, uh, they are requested by a service worker which is basically a network proxy in a browser. Over there you be understand that, the, that this is a SVG sprite and you extract and you basically do a mapping or a sort of mapping that you can think of and uh, depending upon what image is requested by your application you can uh, get that particular SVG and respond back to the application. So your service worker has basically requested for just a single file from your server which, uh, which is SVG master and uh, the application of yours depending upon the use case or whatever it is it can basically get uh, the particular image. Okay. Comes next, uh, cached header for JPEGs. So uh, has any of you uh, uh, read that particular article by Facebook where it said that uh, it wanted to reduce the load time of their uh, Facebook application uh, so much so that uh, their image or uh, the image that is loaded on the, as the cover photo, uh, it gets reduced as even 200 bytes. So that's, how, uh, that's what they were uh, looking forward to uh, implement and they actually implemented it inside their uh, uh, Facebook uh, iOS application and on the native devices. But you can do a similar thing via service workers also. So basically, you, uh, if you intend to reduce the size of your images down to 200 bytes, you'll actually see that uh, a lot of images have their static headers, which is 200 bytes. In those cases, what you'll want to do is cache that particular header in some way and just get the response which uh, which adds up to, to that particular image so that you can uh, reduce the cost of that particular image. So that's, uh, that's how you can use it. Uh, this link refers to the optimization that Facebook, uh, that Facebook did. It, an implementation for the service worker is not available, though uh, if you really intend to, you can write uh, this particular method by your own. Uh, next comes in is uh, push notifications. Uh, so, it, so a live demo will be uh, so how many of you have actually used uh, push notifications? Okay, this is single hand. Uh, so push notifications allow you to uh, allow you to send notifications to your browser to uh, to the subscribers of your website. So for uh, so over here, I have actually subscribed. Uh, okay, I haven't uh, because it's a new laptop. Uh, okay, <laughs> so I do a trigger opt-in. Uh, it shows a pop-up which asks whether uh, whether you want to allow the push notifications or not. Uh, because this is not my laptop, so I would have to ask, uh, can you allow for the yeah, push notifications? Know. Okay. <laughs> well, that's being generous. So uh, once uh, so once you allow, you have basically subscribed to the push notifications from your website or the publisher, in uh, in which case will be uh, the platform user of push crew. Once that's done. Uh, when this guy makes a call uh, to create a request or to send a push notification to all the subscribers, this is the sort of notification that you see on the top right uh, that you can get. 
to all of your subscribers. So let's say that you have a blog post or you have a blog basically and you want to have uh, subscribers like you do for email signups, right? So what you can do is basically uh, uh, have this sort of JavaScript which allows people to uh, be a part of your, uh, uh, be a part of your uh, following and via that you can send push notifications to them uh, which come onto their desktop. If they have accessed it via mobile, they'll get a uh, notification on their mobile. Uh, and it has got better conversions as compared to uh, email notifications. So you should definitely check it out. For now, what, what happens when everybody starts using them? Yeah, when, when everybody starts actually using them, uh, it surely uh, will be, uh, I mean, a hassle because a person will be seeing a lot more uh, notifications. Uh, in those cases, uh, there are also means for, uh, uh, for making those uh, notifications go away. You have those settings in place uh, so that you can um, remove or uh, stop getting push notifications for, from the particular website. Mm. So when, uh, so it's not visible now, uh, but when, uh, when the push notification came, it actually mentioned as to what website you had opted in for. So you can go to that particular website and if they had uh, provided the provision or uh, by doing just a right click on the HTTPS uh, sign, okay, you can basically disable those push notifications from over there. What are you saying is you're subscribed to this blog now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, you can opt it out for sure. Oh. You need to get a new laptop. <laughs> <laughs> now, which emails were you comparing um, okay. this to that it gets more conversions? So I, I actually read their blog post and they were saying that uh, the usual conversions that they saw for the email sign-up letters of their, of their customers was around 27% uh, 20, around. And after this, they were able to see a jump of 35%. Uh, so they were, um, after uh, having the push notifications in place, they were able to see the conversions of people landing up onto their blog post as 37%. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, um, this might not be your forte, but have you seen this used in uh, any e-commerce sites? Uh, okay. Or do you, have you seen an example of this being used uh, with an e-commerce site? Or? I haven't seen so far, though, uh, I mean, in case, so there are several, uh, uh, things that you can do with these push notifications uh, with e-commerce stores. So, uh, do you intend to uh, have an example for the same? Or, or? Uh, I have. Uh, I saw Facebook for the mobile. Uh, okay. Website use push notifications. Uh, okay. For the app. Okay. Without the app, when you use the website uh, sure, yeah. in home. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that's one use case that people have used so far. But surely, I mean, uh, you can think of several other ways. For example, people can. Uh, uh, I mean, if you have abandoned your card, why not send a push notification saying him that uh, you're offering a discount? And uh, if, if a user sees it and uh, is interested, uh, then maybe it can get you a conversion, right? I can just imagine my grandma or, or somebody like not un knowing how to get rid of them and just like putting a sticker at the top right hand side <laughs> of the corner of the screen or something. Just, just I, I can see this being just so, such a horrible abuse mechanism. The problem's already been solved and yeah. faced with the mobile devices, so yeah. I'm sure it'll take some yeah. steps. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe a notification center might come in for Android or iOS as well, where you'll be able to see in a better way as to what other services you are subscribed to. And from over there you can uh, hand it off, like you do for uh, the native devices. Actually there was a notification center uh, which was there in Google Chrome, but they, I mean, disabled it. Uh, because they were seeing that they, it was of no use, I mean, people were not using it actually. So that was the reason for <laughs> removing it altogether. When, when you authorize that, it's just like a, a permanent on, right? So this is like uh, uh, what you do is similarly for getting the location of a particular user. Mm -hmm. So in a similar way that you disable it, uh, that is how you can disable it uh, even for the service worker. I'm just wondering if there's a, sorry to derail this whole thing, but uh, the ability to, to set something like a, a time-based permission would be good. So I can say, all right, okay. I'll give you three weeks to convince me that this is, <laughs> and I want you to know the Safari does stuff like that. I can do Safari location, for example. It'll, have, it'll say, like, you can allow it for now one request or for, like, a day. They don't even allow for, like, indefinite, like Chrome. So okay. it's switch to a privacy-conscious browser render. Uh, I have actually seen that particular uh, feature inside Chrome where uh, when, you're, when you have implemented this particular feature of uh, adding your uh, website as a web application, that is, add to home screen, over there you have a similar concept where uh, it doesn't allow you to actually do it uh, till it has been um, viewed by the user by more than three times or four times. That's how it is. So uh, I'm not sure as to people uh, have uh, abused it for now and uh, Google or any other uh, 
I mean, uh, platform provider sees as it being misused. Though if it will be, uh, and most probably it will, uh, in the near future, so they, they might have a solution in place till then. So uh, the next comes in, what is the security? Uh, by security, I didn't uh, actually mean to say the usability regarding this, uh, but having CSP to work with the service worker. So as of now, you can have any sort of, uh, so uh, with a raise of hand, can, every, uh, can anybody tell as to how many people understand by CSP? Uh, okay, so CSP basically means content security policy that you can uh, uh, implement in your website, which allows you to uh, which allows you to tell the browser as to what sort of uh, resources you want to uh, fetch onto a particular website. What are the domains that you want to whitelist? Uh, what are the scripts or the styles or the images uh, that you want to whitelist? Uh, anything apart from that won't be uh, ever loaded onto your web page. Whether be it a Chrome extension uh, injecting some sort of uh, malicious malware or your ISP actually injecting some sort of script to analyze uh, or uh, get the traffic uh, from uh, for a particular website to analyze a particular traffic. So that's what you can implement. And the, uh, with the integration of CSP, so this is more of a future plan uh, where CSP, when used with service workers, will allow you to actually verify as to what all resources are being fed from a service worker. Okay. So uh, I mean the features are done. Uh, this is like imagination is more important than knowledge. And it's about us as to uh, what, what we think can be the applications. And uh, that is how we can extend this particular community and add up more as plugins to this particular community so that people can use it. Uh, what are uh, the, the features that I have mentioned so far? Uh, they don't have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of code base or, or uh, modules that you can use by yourself. Uh, so if you want to actually contribute, you can uh, for a particular use case and you find it useful for your project as well. You can basically create a module and uh, for the service workers and so that everyone can use it, right? Uh, so the resources that are used and uh, which you can also use to keep track of the uh, to keep track of this particular feature is uh, C for the W3 specs, uh, the service worker specification, uh, the demos that are there on GitHub uh, contributed by Google. Uh, then S Service Worker Ready is a, is a great uh, uh, resource that you can find. Uh, the slides by Ilya Gergrik uh, will help you to understand as to how uh, you can specifically use this uh, service worker for uh, having a network proxy. Uh, my slides will be available, are available actually on slideshare.net and I'll be updating that link on the meetup as well. Uh, so you can uh, see, see my slides from over there. And uh, yeah, that's it for all. Thanks. Do the whole talk without mentioning browser support. Nice. <laughs> okay. In, uh, it's, it's sort of I can only assume it's terrible because you didn't mention it. Uh, what, what's the browser support like? Uh, so it's limited to uh, a very few browsers, uh, and uh, so even though it is, uh, but in the near future you will be uh, having it. And in, if you're able to think of uh, some applications uh, which are there in uh, which are there for most of the users, for example, if you have Chrome users and you are having like uh, a lot of Chrome users of your own websites, uh, then it will be available for them. And if you can think that uh, you can enhance their experience, then why not? So uh, that's what you can take for, for now. Yeah. Any other question? Yes? Okay. I was using web workers before. Okay. So I'm just wondering what is the difference between web workers and service workers? So service worker is a specific implementation of web workers uh, where it allows you to uh, have different integration with uh, other services. For example, there are a lot more things that are coming up in Service Worker, uh, like animation. Uh, like for example, you can have uh, you can you can have a, a, a renderer. Uh, uh, for example, uh, from the from the main page or the main website, you can pass in some reference to your DOM to uh, to your Service Worker so that it can use it for adding uh, uh, so for offloading the process that you will be handling onto your uh, JavaScript to the Service Worker. That's that's how you can use it in differentiation to a web worker. Any other question? Yeah. So the way to invoke a service worker is through calling a URL only? Or? Uh, no, it's not a URL, but uh, it's it's a, a particular strip that should be loaded on HTTPS. And over there, you have to use the navigate, uh, you have to use the basic API, which allows you to register a service worker. Once that uh, service worker has been registered, it calls to a particular URL, which will be your service worker uh, JavaScript. And that will be the one that will be loaded every time a change happen in, uh, a change happens into a service worker or for the first time when it gets registered 
So, so that, sorry to, uh, to follow up on that. Yeah. So the web worker, I can invoke it directly from my application. Sure. Service yeah. worker is invoked. Yeah. Uh, so by me directly, or only by like. So you will be uh, registering a service worker, and then uh, the script will be loaded for your service worker, okay. and that's how it will get. Uh, I, I mean, it has already got registered, though its actual implementation will start when that script is passed and loaded. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Thank you. Thanks.